Good evening and welcome to Science Gallery Bengaluru's exhibition season, Contagion. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, we are Science Gallery Bengaluru, which is a public institution for research-based engagement. We are founded with the support of the government of Karnataka, and we work very closely with three academic institutions in Bangalore, the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences, and Trishti Institute of Art, Design, and Technology. We're also a part of an international network of galleries. So we have eight sibling galleries across the world, five in Europe, two in the United States, and one in Australia. We are the only Asian gallery at the moment. Contagion is our fourth exhibition and our first fully online exhibition season. Our website hosts the archive to our previous exhibitions and we encourage you to go actually have a look. Our lecture series, and we have 23 lectures in this um, exhibition season. Is, so the series is supported by the Indian National Science Academy. And this particular lecture has been facilitated by the United States Consulate General, Chennai. Before I introduce Damon Santola and his lecture today entitled The Network Dynamics of Social Change, may I remind you of our upcoming programs. So we have a lecture by Gagandeep Kang of CMC Vellore on Friday at 6.30 p.m. So our lectures are at the same time, usually on weekends with a few exceptions. Gagandeep Kang is going to speak about COVID-19 vaccines, present and the future. We will have a masterclass by Vijay Chandru, uh, an academic and an entrepreneur on digital epidemiology on Saturday, 29th May at 11 a.m. Followed, by a 5 p.m. behind the scenes at Contagion meet with myself and my team to discuss what we've been doing over the last eight, eight odd months developing this exhibition season. So do join us if you want to learn more about what it meant to put this together. And on Sunday, we end uh, the week's programs um, with a lecture by Christos Lenteris on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. again called Plague and the Emergence of Epidemic Photo Photography. The exhibition itself ends on June 13th, so do make it a point to come along and have a look um, at the various things on offer. Damon Sentola is a professor in the Annenberg School for Communication and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also the director of the Network Dynamics Group and a senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. His research centers on social networks and behavior change. His work has been published across several disciplines in journals such as Science, Nature Communications, PNAS, American Journal of Sociology, Circulation, and the Journal of Statistical Physics. As Damon starts his lecture, do remember you can type in your questions in the Q&A box and do not forget to give us your feedback so that we learn and we get better and we are in touch with what it is that you expect of us. Without much further ado, Damon, may I invite you to deliver the lecture? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I want to share with you a few ideas today from my new book, Change, How to Make Big Things Happen. And this book is really about the new science of how we understand social change happening and really how it overturns most of what we've thought for the last century. It's um, been a remarkable decade for understanding um, the dynamics of social behavior and really the dynamics of um, social movements, uh, political polarization and um, initiatives for spreading new technologies and new ideas. And my interest in this area really started when I was a child. I grew up in a community of, of artists and, and social activists, and I really um, was always excited and interested in, in these sort of social change activities. Um, but it wasn't until I got a little older and I started studying uh, the sciences that I really started to appreciate the excitement of all the new interdisciplinary fields and the ways in which they could be combined to study society and social change in a, in a rigorous scientific way. And so my PhD, I combined sociology with physics and studied the network dynamics of, of change. And that was really the beginning um, in many ways of this work um, and, and the sort of ideas that have matured in this book. Um, and the, the sort of way I want to bring, get us sort of into thinking about these topics is, is really what's, you know, <laughs> front and center for most of us, which is trying to understand all of the changes in our world in the last year, um, 
and what's interesting is is that all of these these changes, which are you know some of them are great, like the emergence of Black Lives Matter, and some of them are you know really challenging, like the you know emergence of increasing polarization, the attack on the Capitol, um, and of course the pandemic, and they're all interrelated. And understanding that and how that actually works and what we can do about it seems overwhelming. But um, this is where you know our, our new science actually helps us a lot. Uh, one of the big questions just to understand from the get-go is how did COVID-19 emerge you know, in Wuhan, China and spread so effectively around the world? And then how is it that you know, that disease could spread really effectively across national boundaries and across political boundaries and social boundaries you know, uh, with complete ease? But um, disease prevention measures like face masks uh, didn't they actually saw you know complete you know clustering and 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 social balkanization depending on you know which political party you belong to or which social economic group you're in, and so the spread of something like face masks really was distinctly different from the spread of something like COVID-19, and we're seeing this again with vaccination, that you know it's sort of grouped by all of these sort of social markers that have nothing to do with diffusion itself, but fundamentally control the dynamics of these behaviors. Um, and outside of the you know, realm of the pandemic, of course, we, we have the sort of increasing problem of polarization and all of the you know, resulting activism we've seen. And um, getting a grip on it is really difficult uh, normally and, and has been historically, but we really do have uh, an amazing new science that's matured in the last decade for understanding these kinds of social changes and really starting to think about how we might wanna intervene um, to address them. And one of the big sort of shifts in thinking that's happened over the last like 10 to 20 years is that instead of studying people as individuals, um, we started studying people as collectives, um, which is to say, if you look at the school of fish um, and you observe their you know, uh, collective behavior, you can imagine studying each of these fish individually one at a time, scanning their brains. And then the question would be, if you knew all the perfect physiological and, and, and um, neurological data about each of these fish, could you ever predict that when you put them all together, they would produce this sort of magnificent, complex and adaptive behavior? Um, could you figure out what to do to intervene to increase the behavior, what to do to disrupt it? And the answer, of course, is no. To understand this collective process that happens when the fish are together, you need to study this collective process as a whole. And that's really what the new science is about. We've never really been able to study these collective processes among humans um, as a phenomenon that's uh, a single you know, population behavior. We've always studied people one at a time. Um, but what's really given rise to this sort of change uh, in our scientific understanding and, and now in our understanding about social policy is the ability to study social networks in a very rigorous way. And so when we look at a large population, this can be, you know, communities, neighborhoods um, offline. This obviously can be social interactions through social media online. What we notice is there are just sort of distinct locations in these networks. There are people who are in the center and they're highly connected. Um, they have ties rating in the outs to lots of you know, different um, parts of the social network. And then there are people who are sort of more like in the periphery, the margins of the network. They have... Uh, a modest number of connections. And those connections tend to be sort of clustered together. You know, so they're friends of friends, all know each other. And the way we often talk about it is that the people who are highly connected have lots of weak ties, you know, sort of jumping all over the network, whereas the people out in the periphery have lots of strong ties, you know, people who know each other well and close relations. Um, and so when we think about, you know, a social spreading process, we have some pretty clear intuitions. These intuitions really date back to some, some foundational work that was done in the 1940s by some sociologists, um, Katz and Lazarsfeld. They really kind of founded this area of studying who is influential and how that influence spreads. And one of the key ideas that was developed was that the idea of the opinion leader, which now we refer to as the influencer, which is the idea that you know if there's someone who's sort of highly connected um, in a in a population, once that person gets hold of an idea, that person can then influence a, a lot of people to sort of take that idea up. And then once it, it starts to spread through that sort of radiating network, then it sort of cascades outward from the center of the network towards the margins, and sort of gets uh, more and more support throughout the population. So this is the classic model of diffusion. This is the model we use for viral marketing, for um, innovation diffusion, for political campaigns, and for 
um, as you've seen with vaccination recently, the whole idea of using influencers to promote vaccination. Um, this is the, the sort of the model of social influence and social spreading that, that really um, we've had for nearly a century. Here's the thing, is that just in the last, like I said, decade or, or 15 years, we've been able to finally get really good data that allows us to critically evaluate how social change processes spread. And so looking here at the spread of Arab Spring, um, we see that when we look at the structure of the network, um, the early sort of innovators who got the sort of uprisings off the ground actually started um, their activist movements in the periphery of the network. And then what happens next is pretty interesting. Instead of jumping to the center and taking over, the mobilization really started to spread around the periphery among sort of modestly connected, socially clustered people. And again, instead of jumping from there to the center of the network, it kept spreading around the periphery of the network and really gained steam until it reached a critical mass and then took over the rest of the population. And so what's striking about this is it really tells two different stories. On the left-hand side, you have the classical story from like the theory of innovation diffusion um, that social change spreads from the center outward. Um, and then you have the data on the right, which tells a very different story, which is that social change, innovations, and new ideas really spread from the margins of the social network, take hold around the periphery, and then take over the population um, in a process that very, very much is like a, a tipping point. Um, and so these are two different stories. And they're importantly different because they give us very different um, uh, methods of first of all, studying social change, but also implementing social change. It tells us you know, that if you wanna get people to adopt vaccination, the way to do it isn't by targeting influencers, it's actually by going to like local neighborhood networks. And that's a very different strategy than what we're doing now. That when we look at these two networks, I could say, well, where do you wanna put your change agent in the, in the social network? Um, here are two locations. And you could say, well, you know, the person who's highly connected in the center of the network on the left Obviously, if I put my change agent close to them, they can activate the person in the center and you get like, you know, massive exposure for your new idea and everyone winds up adopting it. And that's the classic model. And what I want to suggest and what this talk is about, and much of this, this sort of discussion in the book is about, is that actually every single important change event that's happened, you know, in, in the last hundred years has happened in networks that look like the one on the right that that's really where change takes hold. And that violates our intuition. The network on the left looks like speed incarnate, but that only works for things like diseases, you know, for COVID-19. But when it comes to social change, real behavior change and, you know, choices that are difficult and costly, it's the networks on the right that actually get the work done of spreading change and growing really a critical mass. And so really the question here is what goes wrong? Why do, we, why do we make this mistake? What's, what's the cognitive error here? And the fundamental issue is that we base almost all of our thinking on the notion of viruses, that we've got this epidemiological model in our heads of, you know, everything is contagious and everything spreads from person to person. And that gives us a model that, look, if someone's highly connected, that means they can infect a lot of people. And that's certainly true for COVID-19. The question is, does that translate into social change? And that social change can mean people adopting new technological innovations, people um, moving to different neighborhoods, or people, you know, actually um, signing up for for mobilization protests and you know putting their their feet behind their social causes. For all of these different kinds of questions social thinking behaves differently than viruses. So I'm gonna start by talking about really the viral intuition and, and how it fails. And the key uh, concept here, the thing I really want you to go home with today is the distinction between a simple contagion and a complex contagion. That winds up being very much the big idea. And then that gives rise to sort of understanding that most of our intuitions about you know, how things spread um, really are myths. And I talk about those myths, um, you know, in the context of specific cases that we've seen, you know, in the last few decades. Um, and then I bring this sort of home to the question of like, all right, what do we do with behavior change and how do we trigger tipping points? And fundamentally nudges can be helpful, you know, on an individual basis. But again, like the fish schooling, our goal isn't to change people one at a time. Our, our goal is to change sort of the collective behavior of people. And that's really more of a focus on social norms. And so I'll talk about contagiousness, simple and complex, then the myth of virality, the myth of stickiness, and the myth of the influencer.
So when we talk about contagiousness, it's helpful to sort of, you know, frame this in terms of, again, one of the central questions that I started out with, which is, you know, why did the novel coronavirus spread so effectively across all these different, you know, social boundaries, whereas face masks didn't? What's the fundamental difference between these two different kinds of contagions? Um, so let's start with simple contagion. So simple contagions are, you know, the classic model of contagion. This is measles, you know, HIV, COVID-19, influenza, and so forth. Um, and the basic idea is there's someone in your in your network who gets infected, um, and you have sort of contact with them, and then they infect you. And then as a result of that, everyone you have contact with also gets infected. Now that seems really obvious, right? Much like the the two tables. It seems like that's how things spread, right? Well, there's a set of assumptions that are made here um, that are actually really crucial for the science of understanding spreading. And the one thing is that this assumes that contact equals transmission, that basically coming into contact with someone who's infected, you know, in, the, in their sort of relevant way, is equivalent to the disease or the infection or the idea or the, you know, the piece of gossip being transmitted. And again, for you know a simple contagion, that's true. It's true for COVID-19. It's true for a piece of gossip. And it's true for a familiar or easy to understand product. Um, but what if we talk about you know new technologies that are costly or behaviors that are socially risky, like you know wearing face masks when no one else is wearing face masks, or that are you know personally or biologically risky, like getting a vaccination or joining a social movement? Um, we can start the same way we started before. You've got a person in the center and she has a friend who's, you know, advocating for this new um, <clears throat> behavior idea. But the thing to notice is that this person also has a number of social contacts who aren't adopted, which is to say she has a bunch of non-adopters in her network. And what you can see is that for the case of spreading COVID-19, it doesn't matter how many healthy people you know. All that matters is that contact with a sick person. So all those you know, non-adopters or non-infected people are irrelevant. But for a complex contagion, like changing a behavior that goes against people's existing social norms, or starting to wear a face mask when no one else in your neighborhood is wearing a face mask, then all of those non-adopters are actually relevant and important signals. They're countervailing influences. So everyone you see who's not wearing a face mask, all your friends and neighbors, can help to sort of constrain your behavior and encourage you not to adopt a face mask just yet because it's going to feel uncomfortable if no one else is doing it. Now, a second person in your neighborhood may adopt and it may give you sort of more evidence that this is the right thing to do. And then finally, after a third person adopts, you start to feel like, okay, this is the norm. We're all wearing face masks now, and now you wear a face mask. And the point here is that when it comes to changing behaviors, when it comes to sort of spreading complex contagions, People require sort of contact with multiple people, but more than that, they need enough social reinforcement to overcome the resistance, the implicit resistance that comes from seeing people who aren't adopting those behaviors. And this is true for anything that's difficult or unfamiliar or costly. And once we appreciate this difference between simple contagion and complex contagion, this is what really kind of exposes or reveals the sort of essential myths of diffusion. And the, the biggest one is the myth of virality, which is that you know everything spreads like a virus. The second one is this notion of stickiness, which is that if your if your product or innovation is just like better or more, more memorable or has certain properties, then it will spread and be successful. And the third one, and probably the most consequential one for the kinds of policy initiatives and change campaigns we'd like to see, is that uh, influencers are the way to spread things. It's the myth of the influencer. Um, and really, that idea depends on the other two. It's sort of the, the big culminating idea, um, which is why it's been so influential and also why it's so, uh, so very wrong and problematic when it comes to changing uh, people's behaviors like vaccination. So let's start with the myth of virality. Um, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, ideas, behaviors, new products for like a virus was, you know, formalized by, um, by Gladwell in this book, but it, it's more just an elegant articulation of an idea that's been around since the 1940s, the way that we've talked about spreading almost always, you know, uh, since this science began, um, has relied on the sort of common intuition that we're looking at is something that's more or less like a virus. Um, and what we have now is, is really good data from some really interesting studies that tried to use these ideas 
to spread social change. So in the 1960s, a lot of nations uh, were going through what's called the demographic transition. And this is basically agrarian societies becoming modernized. And what happened uh, in the 60s was an unusual moment in sort of the history of the world. Because previously, you know, when a, a country was, you know, modernizing or industrializing, you would have like 50, 60, 70 years um, to transition and that, uh, the adoption of these new technologies, because the technologies, like in the case of Europe and the, and the US, the technologies were being developed and industrialization was being developed and vaccines were being developed and, you know, sanitation and public water was being developed. All these new technologies were sort of coming online as nations were adopting them, which means there was a slow process of innovation and cultural change that by the time these uh, technologies were mature and you had sort of mass distribution of vaccination, you had, you know, um, mass uh, acceleration of food supply, industrialization and production, all of that was basically designed to fit into societies that had changed their notion of family planning and their notion of um, child rearing, their notion of expectations for human capital investments in children and so forth. Um, in the 1960s, nations like Pakistan, Indonesia, and Korea didn't have that kind of time. They were basically being bombarded by this flood of technological innovation. Um, all at once, they got sanitation, vaccination, increased food supply, and so forth. And although those things all seem like goods in the sense that like what nation wouldn't want that, the problem was that families still were maintaining, you know, standard agrarian family planning practices, which is to say having five to six children per family with the expectation of high infant mortality. But with the influx of all of these new technological and modern advantages, infant mortality dropped. And so you wound up having was this sort of Malthusian problem, which is just exponential population growth you know, generation after generation. And so it was really clear that within two generations, you were going to have massive, like dangerously high overpopulation, like within Korea that would lead to, um, you know, problems of, you know, starvation and disease that, that would um, basically swamp the national economy. So uh, there was an urgency to spreading, you know, um, family planning uh, practices that would, you know, change the social norms. And the challenge was that, you know, these practices are entrenched in people's lifestyles, their cultural beliefs, their sort of sense of well-being, their sense of uh, pride and, and success as family members. And so how do you change all of that on a, on a short time scale? And what's so interesting about the story is that lots of different nations were trying to do this at the same time. And most of them use like mass media campaigns, the standard public health initiative that told everyone they need to change their behavior and give them the reasons why. And those nations largely failed to achieve their goals and suffered you know, as a consequence. While Korea um, reached all of its policy goals in less than 20 years. Now that, that's, a, that's a remarkable feat. I mean, uh, you can compare it, for example, to like the US's war on drugs, which started in the early 1970s and by you know, the 2015, um, the U.S. had largely conceded that, like, after, you know, 40 years of work on this, this problem and billions of dollars spent, that the problem had just gotten worse. Um, so, you know, having massive culture change um, at a nationwide scale um, on such a short time scale is really impressive. And so it really invites us to ask the question of what Korea did and why it succeeded. And the answer is that Korea took a focus that wasn't really on telling people what to do or on changing behavior specifically, so much as looking at the ways that social norms would take hold within people's social networks. So here are three different sort of ways of characterizing um, the villages uh, within Korea. One is that you've got some very tightly, on the left-hand side of what we call brokers, some very tightly clustered uh, communities with maybe a single tie, a weak tie, reaching across to another community. Um, and, you know, but largely these different communities are, are disconnected. And then you've got on the far right hand side, basically an urban network, largely cosmopolitan, everyone's interacting with everyone. Um, but in the middle, you have this case, which I refer to as wide bridges. And this is a case where you have, you know, community clusters where people are sort of more involved with some people than they are with everybody else. But across these clusters, you've got sort of reinforcing ties that create what is in essence a wide bridge. So wide bridge just means 
multiple reinforcing social connections across different groups. Um, whereas in the, in the case of the brokers, where each group is tightly clustered, the connection across groups is a single tie or a narrow bridge, right? So basically relies on that one person to communicate information across the two group of groups. So what happens when you try to initiate, you know, a, a sort of contraceptive initiative in these different kinds of networks is the network on the left, you end up getting good buy-in within the group that tr is trying to initiate it and everyone adopts, but there's not enough social reinforcement to spread the idea to other people in other groups who are already, you know, maintaining existing family practice, family planning practices, the status quo. And so they can't be convinced to change their behavior. Right, so this is the question of which of these networks is really effective for spreading this complex contagion. Um, in the urban network, you basically get no buy-in whatsoever because your sort of early adopters or your sort of change agents can't even coordinate with each other because they're just sort of interacting with lots of different people and they're ineffective at growing any support for this change initiative, let alone you know, spreading it to the large you know, majority of the population. The special case and the case that uh, was discovered in Korea, the sort of the Korean village networks that were most effective in spreading the adoption of contraception were networks that had this structure where you had, you know, closely um, knit uh, groups and they were essentially women's groups within uh, different parts of the village and they would coordinate with each other um, and sort of, you know, promote the adoption of vaccination or sorry, the adoption of uh, contraception. Um, and then, uh, and then it would sort of spill over to other groups, other parts of the village and other, other sort of members of the community. And it would sort of cascade from group to group to group through these reinforcing ties, ultimately generating large amounts of, of buy-in and fundamentally a change in the social norms within the village. And what's so interesting about this idea of, of you know, looking at the sort of clusters within the village and how the interconnections between those clusters help us to understand change in norms, is that this very idea translates perfectly into our understanding of organizational networks. Is that by and large, organizational networks are often um, structured in divisions or teams where they can be like highly siloed, these sort of divisions um, within an organization and people interact heavily within their group, but not a lot across the group. And one of the sort of big insights um, in you know, network theory and sociological theory in the 90s was, well, if you could find someone who would play the role of the broker and sort of bridge these ties, you know, um, essentially between different groups, that person could perform this huge service for the organization and information could now flow between these disparate groups. Um, more importantly, now talking in a, in a sort of you know, organizational context, um, this person who can perform this broker role actually gains a lot of individual advantage. They get known as someone who has lots of information about what's going on in the organization. They are known as someone who's good at you know, spreading things across different places. And they also get tapped on the shoulder by you know, more people um, and, and, and you know, people higher up because they're the person who gets to be known for being in the know and sort of in the mix in terms of what's happening in all different parts of the firm. So all of this seems good, which is to say, not only does it perform an organizational benefit, but this idea of creating these sort of narrow bridges or these sort of link, links across the network um, performs, you know, uh, creates benefits for, you know, the broker as well as for the organization. But here's the thing. That's true if what we're looking at is the spread of information in the sense of a simple contagion. But what if Robert wants to institute a change in the culture of the organization? A change in the social norms of how people are acting, let's say the gender culture within the organization, norms and expectations about equal pay, norms and expectations about sexual harassment, how does that spread? Is a single tie across you know, these different groups enough to convey the value and the practices that are sort of being advocated here and whether or not they'll be successful and adopted as they spread from group to group? And the thing is that if people in group A hear from Robert of this initiative, that's fine, now they know about it. But in order to change their behavior, to be convinced that this is a new and legitimate behavior, they have to see other people engaged in the behavior. They have to feel comfortable that this is actually an expectation of them and also that they understand what that means for their daily practice and their, their sort of routines. So imagine how the networks look like this. So we've changed the narrow tie, the narrow bridge, from A to B into a wide bridge. Now we have multiple reinforcing connections. This does a tremendous amount of work 
in terms of accelerating the diffusion of, of innovation and cultural change. All of a sudden, people in group A have multiple ties and people in group B. They can see people in group B adopting this new behavior and how the people in group B coordinate with each other. More importantly, people in group A can now talk to each other about their observations and coordinate with one another about getting the rest of the people in group A to adopt this new norm or convention. And so what this means is, while the idea of brokers and the idea of narrow bridges across an organization is useful for thinking about the spread of information, it's not really useful for thinking about the spread of innovations, which require these wide bridges to create trust, confidence, and fundamentally a sense of legitimacy in this new organizational change. And you know, in the book, I describe this not just in the context of a single organization, but also in networks that form across organizations, whether you know, brokerage networks are effective for not just spreading information, but whether they can help organizations to share ideas and to coordinate and collaborate within industries. Um, and one of the big lessons from open innovation in Silicon Valley is that the successful firms created these wide bridges of like deep overlapping engagement that created trust and coordination across you know, organizational boundaries. So what this tells us overall is that there's this sort of deep lesson about the structure of white bridges and what this means for the capacity for innovation and social change. And when now what we wanna ask is, okay, well, you know, what can we do with that? As an innovator, how would I, how would I use that structure to make change? Um, and so this is where we kind of transition from looking at the different kinds of structures you find within village networks, the different kinds of structures you find within organizations to saying, OK, if there's a given structure, how, do, how would I go about targeting it? Um, so if I thought that the contagion was a viral contagion, a simple contagion, um, I would pretty much target a network the way on the left. I would find you know, all the different groups and clusters and I'd put a change agent in every single cluster. Right? I get maximum exposure for this idea and that's viral thinking. But here's the thing, if this change is a new idea, it's uncomfortable, unfamiliar, it's not very well accepted, it's not gonna be perceived as legitimate. So even though each of these people is doing it, they're also doing it alone as far as anyone else knows. Everyone around them in their social network basically is, is ignoring them. So what winds up happening is that they're not effective at all for initiating change because they don't have any support. And ultimately these people, surrounded by everyone maintaining the status quo, will probably give up the change initiative and go back to the status quo as well. You can only sort of stand out and be a deviant for so long before you kind of are brought back into the fold. But what happens if we take the same number of change agents and now do something kind of counterintuitive? We cluster them together within sort of one part of the social network. Now, from the perspective of viral marketing or viral diffusion, that's a, a sort of a crazy idea because essentially you're, you're sort of reducing the impact of your resources. You're limiting their exposure to the network, you know, and, and, and essentially you're having them connected to each other. This would be like having a bunch of telemarketers call one another. What would be the point? You know, we're all telemarketers. The point here is that because your change agents are connected to each other, they can talk to each other about the change initiative. And this is, of course, you know, the, the way in which the Korean villages were successful is you had new people who are adopting the contraceptive norm, coordinating with each other. They could talk, talk about it with one another, support each other's decision to adopt contraception, discuss their sort of concerns and, and some of the challenges with using it month to month. And then they can coordinate with each other to influence other people who could observe them having this conversation, which created sort of social currency within this group. And then once that happened, then just like I showed you before, this would spill over to the next group and then spill over to other groups. So the same sort of social reinforcement process across wide bridges. And this gives us a very good understanding about how social and cultural change happens, both within sort of, you know, um, really, you know, endogenous uh, networks that take hold in villages and other, in other cases and neighborhoods, um, but also within organizational networks where we can sort of help to manufacture uh, sort of connectedness through wide bridges. And then we can help to target and initiate change initiatives within those organizations. One of the most interesting lessons from the spread of contraception in Korea is that this spreading process, which happened exactly the way that you see in, in these sorts of models of diffusion, um, grew through this sort of overlapping networks across women's groups and generated, you know, uh, complete agreement on the method of contraception that was adopted in the village. 
And this really sort of brings us to the punchline of the next myth, which is the myth of stickiness. And the myth of stickiness is that there are certain features of a product that make it inherently more attractive, more likely to spread. You know, it's emotional, um, it's got certain triggers, it's public, it's practical, it's got social currency, it's fun to talk about, it's memorable and so forth. I mean, we've all heard these ideas, but we've got case after case after case uh, from the history of product development and, and the history of economics that show all these um, market uh, examples of, you know, inferior products that were poorly marketed <laughs> that shouldn't have won, but yet did win. And what happens in every one of these cases is that although there's a serial, uh, sort of superior product that's better marketed, that seems like the right technology, um, it loses because it didn't exploit social networks in the right way. And the inferior option wins because it got a hold of the social network in the very same way that we were looking at in Korea, and then was able to sort of manufacture social reinforcement that caused that option to then take hold. And so this seems like an interesting sort of take home lesson from the history of product adoption, but it actually has huge and important implications for understanding some of our you know, contemporary and most vital social change initiatives. So um, one of the, the strategies in Sub-Saharan Africa to spread HIV prevention uh, was for a long time male circumcision, but this ran into enormous uh, cultural backlash to the extent that some of the aid workers um, in, in Kenya and other countries were actually attacked because it, this, this intervention was you know, a profanity, both you know, culturally and religiously. Um, you know, to the locals. And so people in public health had to do sort of a, a very serious moment of like gut checking and try to figure out what they could do that would be effective for changing entire populations to, you know, behaviors that would be effective for preventing the spread of HIV. Um, but at the same time, not violate standard, you know, cultural norms and customs that would be much less invasive. And in essence, they, the idea was to, you know, to develop a stickier product. Um, and there was, in fact, a massive breakthrough um, called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Um, and you'll see this. This is currently, you know, being advertised and spread in U.S. cities now as well. Um, and there was this huge study across, you know, three different uh, sub-Saharan nations. Um, and it was a large, uh, one of the largest in, invested um, studies by the Na uh, National Institutes of Health to uh, address this challenge of, you know, HIV uh, pandemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what they did was exactly what the kind of, you know, stickiness playbook told them to do, which is they developed a technology that was free, it was accessible, it was essentially one daily Tylenol. And it was 90% effective. So basically you take a Tylenol a day and then you can have sex without a condom and very low likelihood of having any um, HIV transmission. It seems like a win for everyone. Plus they, you know, they created, you know, outreach centers all around each of these uh, communities and each of these nations and, you know, made sure everyone knew about it. Huge information diffusion campaigns and huge like public policy and um, you know, uh, governmental efforts to promote, you know, the use of this. And then they even created a study where they brought village members in from different nations to be part of this, um, you know, weekly check-in to make sure that they were adopting it and they would check their blood levels and everything to make sure they were still healthy. Um, and what wound up happening was nothing short of a fiasco, <laughs> which is that the people who were actually in the trials, who were coming every week, to be convinced uh, to you know take the medication, they would pick up the take medication and go home and get their payment. I mean, these are people who aren't just you know ignoring this innovation. They're actually part of the study community. When their blood levels were measured, fewer than 30% of those women who are part of the study actually had PrEP in their bloodstream. So this is mind-boggling. And the, and there was actually a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that spent a lot of time basically doing hand wringing over the fact that so much time, so much effort, and so much money had been spent with this intervention as like, you know, the kind of uh, golden demonstration of the value of the strategy. And it failed more colossally than anyone could have anticipated. And what wound up happening was that even though the product was sticky and the message was clear and the message was sticky and so on and so forth, 
there were social norms in the community that prevented people from adopting. First of all, people had the fear that taking the pill to prevent HIV would actually give them HIV. Now, that sounds crazy at first, but then there's a large number of people who think that getting a flu vaccine will give them the flu in the U.S. Um, it's, it's just a common misconception. Um, but then there was also very strong discrimination norms against people who had HIV. So these two fears, right, combine um, so that people are fear that if they get, you know, HIV from the pill, that those will that would then have to deal with all the norms of discrimination. Or if their neighbors know that they're taking the pill and their neighbors suspect that the pill can cause HIV, then even if they know it's not true, they just have to worry about their neighbors' um, worries that maybe by virtue of taking this preventative medic medication, they're actually perceived of as someone who has higher risk, right? And so the social norms and the misconceptions that are reinforcing within that culture um, wind up being far more influential on people's behaviors than the cleverness of the innovation, the catchiness of the advertising or the use of influencers. And so the point here is that in order to sort of understand social change, we fundamentally have to understand the social norms that frame people's receptiveness or resistance to a new idea. So let's talk about this, the myth of the influencer. So when we look at this kind of network and we see that, right, the people in the center who are highly connected and the people in the periphery who have modest connections, um, we tend to have this like, very clear idea, which is there's two things about the influencer or the highly connected person that makes them effective. One is they very easily can detect a new idea in the world. So if we imagine the person on the left at the center of this, of this network is, uh, is a Fortune 500 CEO. And she can find you know, very early on new ideas, new technologies to adopt, new management strategies and, and um, new uh, office technologies for increasing you know, productivity. So, she's exposed to an idea like this. And we say, oh, right, because she's exposed to it, she can adopt it, right? And then she can tell everyone else. And that seems to sort of resonate with all of our intuitions. It's certainly how viral contagion works, right? It's a person who's highly connected is gonna come in contact with a virus before other people because they have so many connections. Once they get sick, they can infect a lot of people. That's our notion of super spreaders. Um, and we tend to generalize this to everything from you know, Fortune 500 firms adopting new management practices to the spread of technologies like Twitter to the growth of movements like Black Lives Matter, right? But here's the difference between a viral contagion and a social contagion. When a contagion is complex, that person in the middle, sure, they're gonna discover the idea early on and a Fortune 500 CEO will probably discover you know, a new technology or new management strategy before, let's say someone on the right, like a, a small startup uh, a CEO. But here's the thing is that that person, because they have so many social contacts, also knows they have a lot of people watching them, a lot of people evaluating what they do, criticizing and commenting on what they do. So they're actually highly socially constrained by their wealth of social contacts. And they also know that if they adopt this thing early on and it goes south on them, that actually they take a huge hit you know, reputationally. Whereas the person on the right hand network they have a modest number of contacts. It only takes a few adopters to convince them that this thing is actually a reasonable thing to do. They don't have as many countervailing influences surrounding them. And then if they do adopt, then they can commit some of their friends and neighbors to adopt, and they can sort of generate a reinforcing cluster of support. And actually that reinforcing cluster of support winds up being way more powerful early on for generating the growth that gets a critical mass. And it's the critical mass that ultimately gets the influencer to pay attention. The secret to change isn't about forcing it on a population through you know, high profile people. It's about growing it within a population so that the norms actually become the sort of the root point for changing uh, social behavior. And so we can hold the case of like the HIV program failure um, and the glass failure as cases that kind of slammed into social norms with the Korean contraception case, which is a case that actually harnessed social norms and grew change effectively. And we see this actually in lots and lots of cases that, you know, back since the 1970s, there's been example after example, you know, both offline diffusion, in institutional change, online diffusion, Arab Spring. Um, we just have, you know, the, the better our data get, the more examples we have of social change not spreading from highly connected people at the center of the network, but actually taking hold in the margins of the network and spreading from there. And so what this gives rise to ultimately is the fundamental question, and this is where I'm going to sort of end the talk, is with 
whom do we target? Which is to say, what do we do with the science now that we understand that what we thought for so long is wrong? Uh, how do we take action? So many of the sort of scholars in this area think, well, okay, it's maybe hard to activate a social star, but what if we could do it? This is, of course, what gets us into the, the kind of Google Glass problem. And the assumption for most people is that, well, it wh whatever's going to spread, it's going to spread, you know, like a viral contagion, a social, you know, like a, a, a viral video or a social meme or something. And so if we can just get a highly connected person to adopt it, it'll spread throughout the network. Um, the challenge for that point of view, right, is that that notion relies on the idea that there are certain special people who can basically push their will onto everybody else. And again, for simple things that can be effective, but now what if we're talking about social change where people are, you know, entrenched in the status quo quo, they actually like the social norms they're part of, or at least they're used to coordinating with the people around them. So they can't just unilaterally change behavior. Like you can if watching a viral video, there's not a lot of countervailing pressure. You can just watch it. But when it comes to changing behavior or supporting a social movement like Black Lives Matter, um, or shifting you know, public acknowledgement of a social movement, like changing your Facebook profile to support same-sex marriage, these are cases where you actually are paying attention to the other people around you and there's social risk with adopting a change. And in cases like this, just because an influencer adopts doesn't mean anyone else is going to adopt because influencers have countervailing influences and everyone around the influencer also has countervailing influences. And so there's not much efficacy there. But what if we can identify places in the network out here in the periphery where we can have reinforcing clusters of people who can adopt together and then trigger sort of this, this cascade process through wide bridges out in the periphery of the network. And what's so interesting about this process is that when it take hold, takes hold and succeeds, it doesn't just spread everywhere at once. It actually spreads in a kind of a deliberate way through very specific pathways around the periphery of the network till it reaches a critical mass. And then it cascades through the center and around the population. And in the book, I talk about what this means for the spread of Black Lives Matter. I talk about the growth of uh, support for marriage equality. I talk about the success of Twitter, also for the growth of uh, solar panels, um, spread of changes in norms in medicine to address um, gender and race bias. Um, it's also true for addressing you know, ch challenges to um, political discourse and democracy, You know, basically initiatives that um, my work and my team have designed um, to reduce political polarization through creating social network constructs online that allow people to learn from each other instead of to engage in, um, you know, what was it, what essentially heated political discourse. Um, we've also used the same analysis to understand the growth of the Me Too movement and fundamentally to bring it back to our essential question about, you know, face masks and vaccination, these same strategies are now being used to sort of implement new vaccination campaigns. And so what this means overall is that when it comes to our core intuitions, right, about spreading, when I say, what's the difference between COVID-19 and face masks, hopefully you actually can start to see the world differently now. You can see that COVID-19 is going to spread really effectively in the network on the left. But if you want to spread face masks, it's the network on the right that's going to do the trick. And the punchline here is, is for any new behavior that's costly or difficult or unfamiliar, um, social reinforcement typically requires the sort of uh, the, the, the networks that create um, channels of wide bridges across different communities. And this really changes us from thinking about nudges to sort of change one person's behavior at a time to norms. We can spread change across entire populations and fundamentally gives us a vision for social capital. They're very much like financial or human capital. We can actually create social capital in these sort of structures um, online and offline that help to grow change and ultimately create the change that we want to see. Thank you, Damon. That was very interesting. And I, I'm fairly certain that there are going to be lots of questions. We've already got several in the box. I'm going to start asking you questions. Um, so Arvin would like to ask you, while information disseminated by influencers has significant reach, but taking action based on information requires something extra. What, according to you, is the differentiating factor in the information and information processing, which results in action versus where information is just assimilated? 
in effect what about the information itself brings down the cost of action yeah it has to do with the degree to which um the behaviors that we're interested in which is to say that the information is attempting to um, encourage us to do or to right. um, get us to think about is information that goes against what we already believe. So if you think about it almost always when it comes to behavior change in right. terms of what people are doing now. Um, and so there's always the kind of reference point of the status quo. And the status quo is implicitly and invisibly reinforced by everyone around us. And that's one of the sort of hardest things to understand when we think about the spread of behavior is that it's really natural to think about stuff kind of spreading on top of our world. We think of the world as this fixed thing and, you know, we're kind of spreading diseases through it and, you know, spreading information through it. But when it comes to behaviors, um, mm -hmm. What we're also doing is actually not spreading, you know, through an existing world. We're actually shifting that world as the stuff, as the new contagion spreads. And whenever the, you know, um, information coming to us challenges what we believe, uh -huh. then networks don't operate as pipes, right? The, the standard way people talk and think about social networks is that they are essentially simply conduits for transmission. Uh -huh. And when it comes to complex contagions, that's an incorrect understanding of networks. Networks aren't simply pipes, they're actually prisms. What the network around us is doing is shaping and coloring the information we see and determining whether we believe it and ultimately how we integrate it into our lives. And so this is why you take a totally different approach to spreading belief and behavior change. Lovely. Um, our next person would like to know, Does does this apply to organizations or companies as well, meaning the informal networks within the organizations? I suspect the answer is yes, right? Yeah, as I spoke about, um, the work applies obviously to communities and to social change more broadly, but of course it's also been applied in my book and other you know, publications I have to organizational networks specifically. Um, and there's two different ways of thinking about organizational networks, and I sort of talked briefly about that today. Um, one is to talk about the divisions or um, teams within an organization and how they're connected. That's the intra-organizational network. And then, of course, there's things like Silicon Valley um, or places where you've got lots of different organizations coordinating with each other. Um, the Japanese high-tech industry is another really good example. And so that's another case where you see the structure of the bridges between um, units. In this case, the units are, are firms. Um, being highly significant for the process of innovation and adaptation. Hmm. So in fact, uh, there's a follow-up question which probably borrows an answer from what you've just said, where uh, one of our audience members would like to know, how were Silicon Valley companies able to implement complex seeding for various, so or, or across different demographics? Yeah, so I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. Are you talking about the origins of growth in Silicon Valley among firms? Or are you talking about a specific innovation change in Silicon Valley? I think we'll leave it for them to come back precisely what they meant, because I read you the question exactly as, as they had asked. Uh, so yeah. instead of me interpreting, uh, we'll let them come back. I can, well, I can answer <laughs> what I think sure. it means. Um, sure. So uh, the, I, in the book, I have a, a chapter where I discuss Silicon Valley specifically um, in terms of the, the growth of the um, really the, the innovation and, and human and social capital there. And um, Silicon Valley really violated a lot of the norms and, and the sort of rules of organizational networking that had been established previously by, you know, large firms like IBM, where typically firms had very like high organizational boundaries, like high walls around them. And the right. idea was that everything that happens within a firm is owned by that firm and, you know, not a lot of information exchange or, or contact across firm boundaries because, you know, basically the incentives within the firm serve the firm and the incentives of people outside the firm are assumed to not be in the firm's interest. Um, and Silicon Valley really shifted that model and started having like really in, engaged working teams and actually, you know, insight and um, uh, management influence from people working at other firms who are partnering with with the firm, um, shifting the sort of agenda, shifting the sort of style of, of um, 
of technology and development and ultimately helping and coordinating in the sort of bringing to market of new products. And um, that's, again, a model that was also, I think, first pioneered in the Japanese high tech industry. But it really is a change in thinking about what a relationship is within within a business and uh, ecology or an industrial ecology. Hmm. Um... Are brokers the same as boundary spanners? Yeah, so boundary spanning is a is a more general concept. Um, and so that's used in sociology to refer to people who um, and categories in general, like so this can be products that don't exist neatly within one well defined category. So for example, um, Skype. Um, now we use Zoom, right? But these these technologies originally didn't quite fit. They weren't telephones, right? Um, and uh, they weren't televisions. Um, but so we didn't really have a well-defined technology. Then we came up with the concept of video conferencing, right? So then now we have like a term that we use. But um, of course, it's true for Facebook. True. It's true for like every innovative technology. We don't really have a place it fits. Um, but, you know, those technologies can fail because they don't fit anywhere um, but then they can succeed in a very special way if, uh, because they can define a new category um, for people uh, you can say yes someone who has relationships across different groups can be thought of in some ways as um, boundary spending but it's not quite the right concept um, mm -hmm. brokerage is a very specific and technically defined and well understood concept in sociology and the study of organizational behavior um, and so brokerage is sort of the core concept i'm focusing on there which is a person who forms narrow bridges or weak ties across a lot of different units and acts as mm -hmm. like an information hub um, and so um, i would want to keep the concept of boundary spending distinct from the concept of brokerage precise then uh, Subhashree from Chennai would like to know, what is the role played by dominant cultural preferences or traditions in the process of social change and in building broader bridges? Yeah, so that's, I mean, the, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of this work is trying to answer that question, which is um, the degree to which, you know, change almost by definition is something that pushes against dominant cultural traditions, right? So um, the question is really about resistance. What creates resistance to a new idea or a new behavior? Um, and again, in the book, I describe the different kinds of what I refer to as social mechanisms, but essentially are like the reasons we have for resisting change. And they're usually tied to, you know, our standard cultural norms or mores, which, which um, we're deeply invested in just because we understand them. And there's, there's a, a process by which the, the um, experience of social coordination and the customs that we live in um, do a lot of invisible work in sort of convincing us um, to take certain behaviors as natural and see other behaviors as foreign. Um, and so when it comes to changing behavior, it really has to do with the extent to which the, the new idea or the new behavior um, forces us to abandon the thing that is the status quo. Um, and uh, and fundamentally, that question comes down to almost always an issue of legitimacy. To what extent is a new behavior perceived as legitimate? And that is almost always the case. It's not perceived as legitimate if it goes against existing cultures and norms. So Mark has a, Mark Pizzato has a question for you. How do you identify edges of a network in the real world? Are not all networks interconnected, already bridged? not circumscribed as in your models, especially with current transportation and internet, internet technologies. Does your model also consider resistances between network bridges? Yeah, so um, whenever you're, when this is more generically for network science, whenever you study any kind of network, you're always looking at a population that has some presumed bounds, right? Um, we can always imagine a set of connections that get us from one part of the planet to another part of the planet. Um, but it doesn't mean that those connections are relevant or operating for the kind mm -hmm. of thing we're interested in, right? Mm -hmm. And so the boundary is defined by, you know, are we talking about change with an organization? Well, that org although those people obviously have ties all over the place as people, when we're talking about the change of a culture with an organization, we're talking about the bounded network that's structured within the organization. Um, it's the same if we're talking about within a community or within a nation, right? We usually have a kind of 
um, a goal-oriented approach when we're thinking about networks and change. And so those goals set the boundary for the population that we're interested in. Again, I talk about this in the book. Um, Joe Christopher says, I was going back to my university classes on the role of communities versus that of societies, drawing from journeys. We were taught to think that both these categories think and act differently. Of course, this theory is more than 100 years old now. In a digital world, do these categories blur into each other? Does information flow among these categories in the same manner or in the same way? Yeah, the notion of community certainly meant something different um, than it has now. Look, there's one of the issues um, with any social, well, any science really, but like social science in particular, is that you've got lots of people coming from different different fields, right? You've got like anthropology, sociology, political science, and then all the subdisciplines that study their respective areas, and also you know um, ecology and human ecology and so forth. And um, terms are defined in often idiosyncratic ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way that the term community is often used now in like a modern network science context is, you know, as a bounded group of people who are all interacting within some, you know, consistent normative structure. Um, and so that can be a community online. And that can consist of like hundreds of thousands of people who are all part of um, some site where they agree on like what the rules are. Um, and new sites can come along. Like, so one that was a very conservative site that came along was called Parler. And if Parler was, you know, the capital attack in the US in January was attributed to the presence of Parler online and what, you know, how it incentivized um, and mobilized uh, people to talk and think in a way that was um, much more um, conflictual and also uh, based around some of the, the Trumpian views. And, um, and that was a community of 4 million people. Right. And so those people were located in lots of different places. They lived they lived their homes, their neighbors were different people, but they somehow created a community that managed to have this sort of power to, to operationalize um, their beliefs in, in this sort of action. You can talk the same way about Black Lives Matter. You can talk yeah. about it as a community, even though it spans the nation and, you know, in, in some cases, in some process events through the globe. And so um, there are these networks I talk about in the book and that form sort of either intentionally or endogenously across what we think of as traditional community boundaries. Um, and so again, it's, it's really important to, to get specific in terms of what we're talking about so we can, we can sort of um, operationalize these terms, community, society, and so forth, in ways that are effective for you know, ultimately doing predictive science. Hmm. So there's an interesting question from a young person who participated in one of our workshops who says, uh, who, um, who would like to ask you how your work connects with the spread of emotions within these networks or what role do emotions have to play? And the, the reason for asking that question is that um, they learned in the workshop that anger spreads faster than other emotions. And therefore, what does that, how does that relate to, for example, um, how behavior moves, right? I mean, we, we've, of course, in, in sociology and political science also looked at crowd behavior and mob violence. And, you know, um, those are more instantaneous. Those are not long-term social change, social transformation. But what is the role then of uh, emotions in this, in this um, you know, schema or the system, this rather precise actually system that you, that you think through? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's an interesting question. I would say that I've kind of two responses. One is the sort of more general question of the role of emotions, which I, I talk about in the book. But um, the first the first thing I want to say in response is one always has to be careful when saying things like anger spreads faster than other emotions. Mm -hmm. That kind of statement is taken, it's without context, it's without reference to anything, and it makes it sound like there's some kind of psychological truism. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just not the case. Um, there are contexts in which you can certainly imagine those kinds of heated emotions, you know, spreading effectively. Um, mm -hmm. There are other kinds of contexts. If we're all, um, you know, if we're all in meditation at an ashram, various, you know, certain kinds of behaviors will spread and certain kinds of emotions will spread more effectively in that community than mm -hmm. others. And it's not the case that like anger is going to take a hold particularly easily. Um, uh, whereas something like, you know, joy or um, uh, reverence might, right? So there's different ways of thinking about the, the sort of the setting and again, the population bound, bounds that we're looking at. Um, and I'm always reluctant, um, and the science here has been really informative, um, 
that when we try to take, and this is kind of the schooling of the fish example I used at the beginning of the talk, when we try to take kind of individual psychological rules and then apply them to, you know, populations as a whole, we almost always wind up kind of stepping on our own feet. Um, there you can say, well, for a person, if I give them a different set of stimuli, I can trigger anger more easily. It's like, well, that's a person in a lab, right? So sure. But like people who are making decisions in a natural setting are surrounded by other people and they're in various contexts. And there are, you know, all of these factors that are social and largely invisible hmm. that are hugely influential. And it's hard to replicate that sitting in a lab, giving people a stimuli, right? Um, and so that's, that's where the sort of this all this work, um, particularly as I said, the last decade has really advanced the science enormously, has given us a very new kind of a new footing for talking and thinking about these issues. That's honestly it's less intuitive. It you know it's easier to just talk about you know people and how people are and then generalize that, but um, scientifically that model doesn't really work. So um, when it comes to talking about emotional contagion, I would say absolutely emotions are a huge part of the contagion dynamic and. Um, in one of the chapters of the book, I, I talk um, in some detail about the role that emotions play, specifically um, in uh, in the contagion uh, of various different kinds of behavior, and how emotion has some like really subtle, interesting ways of either um, engaging to create resistance to a behavior. Thinking here of like um, populations of sports fans who are entrenched in you know loyalties to their various teams or populations of political um, you know partisans who are loyal to their <laughs> respective parties and causing you know resistance in the U.S. We have this huge issue uh, debate over climate change and it's largely divided, divided along party lines as if you know because you're a member of a political party you suddenly can't read a graph right and and so that's like a, re a remarkable thing but it's true it like significantly affects your ability to interpret information just oh. by having a certain political affiliation um, and so that what's going on there is that your political affiliation is engaging a set of emotional responses that are far more effective in in determining how you're influenced by others than the information that you're hearing um, and so emotional triggers and emotional contagion are actually hugely important in a lot of the, the issues that we care about there are many more questions but we, we know we have to bring this towards a closure yeah. because we know you know you have a tutorial session ahead of you right. i'm going to ask you the last question for the evening where um one of our audience members is says i'm wondering here about democratic resistance against ideas or interventions that are seeded from top down and how the network designer or modeler such as a policymaker, understands the importance of this in other words how do we account for refusal as a potentially good thing within a complex contagion approach of network models? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and I, that's something that uh, is, is right on target with the, the work that I do, which is to say um, uh, a lot of people in the US right now, as you know, are focused on this question of vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. Um, and there are populations that are consistently um, reluctant to get vaccinated, particularly for, you know, COVID-19, um, and what we're seeing is that they're really well-defined social groups. Um, in particular, right now, it's Republican men who are the group that's like, you know, um, significant less likely to get vaccinated than anybody else. Um, and then there's also other groups like the African-American community, and that is a result of this very specific kind of racist history where the African-American community has been abused by American public health. Um, and so what gets really uh, important here is to do very good social science, which is to say, the goal isn't just to convince people who don't want to get vaccinated to get vaccinated. The goal is actually to improve the relationship between communities that are resistant to this kind of public health information because of the norms and the biases in those communities. Yes. Um, to shift those biases in a way that actually allow them to have a more productive engagement, not just with issues related to COVID-19 vaccination, but yeah. with, you know, information that may come in the future for like the next, you know, um, set of public health issues that come in the next three to four years. And so, uh, and so fundamentally, um, we don't, I think in, in any good democratic society, we don't want a population of people who just do whatever the government tells them to do, right? Um, we want people to be critical thinkers, we want them to evaluate it. And that can be frustrating in public health because people are often trying to just find techniques and tactics to get people to sort of do the thing they want them to do, whether that's, you know, the obesity epidemic that everyone was worried about 10 years ago, or now the, the sort of vaccination challenge everyone's worried about now there's always this idea of using what are, you know, whatever 
psychological techniques are on on sort of um, uh, on the table at the moment. Like so, right now everyone talks about nudges, but these are basically tricks. They get yeah. people to like do the thing you want them to do without really shifting their fundamental thinking. Um, and the question is, is that how governments should develop policies is by tricking people into doing what they want them to do? Or do we want people to be critical and clear and evaluative? And if they want to say no, they can, but we really want them to have an engaged and nuanced um, understanding of the information that's available so they can be like responsible citizens. And I think that that ultimately is the goal of a lot of these intervention strategies. And this is something I didn't talk about in the talk, but um, the last uh, two chapters of the book go into detail about not just changing behavior or, you know, growing um, some kind of, of movement, but um, reducing bias and having that be an important part of how these networks operate within communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damon. This is, you know, uh, I trust our audiences um, recognize like I do. Good social, science, good social science, understanding change in context and sort of, you know, more precise definitions of what we work with, more precise sort of, you know, running an argument through property, like, you know, yes, there are networks, but what's relevant and, you know, uh, uh, where, what, what, are, what is it that change works through or how does, how does um, any kind of behavioral change travel or how does any message travel for, for that matter and identifying the relevant links as opposed to just identifying the fact that there might be links uh, is, is certainly one of the very few takeaways uh, for me this evening. So thank you again. Uh, for those of you who have enjoyed the lecture like I have um, and want to share it with your colleagues and friends, uh, David's lecture, like the other 22 lectures, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, and in case you've missed any of the previous lectures, do please go check the lectures out there. Um, I wanted to say that also I believe you're, we have uh, now um, social media around the, this work. And so there's, um, I believe, a link that's uh, being posted in the chat but for the Instagram and the Twitter accounts and so forth that have a lot of the new, newer work that we're doing on this as well. Wonderful. So uh, do have a look at the links that have been posted in the chat box and do follow them. Uh, as you will recognize, Damon's work is really interesting and will help us understand, um, as is the goal of this exhibition season, understanding transmission as a concept, ideas, behaviors, diseases. I'm sure you found the lecture interesting, so please do check out the exhibit When the World Was a Laugh by Anais Tondeur and the Chameleon Project by Tina Gonzalez. Both the exhibits explore emotional contagion. Do also consider registering for the event How Ideas and Behavior Spread Through the Crowd by Daniel Richardson on Sunday, 6 June at 4 p.m. Do give us our feedback, register for future programs, and, and absolutely do not forget to visit the exhibition website. Thank you again, Damon, for the lecture and for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Andrew uh, Barbagallo, Brinda Jayakant, Madhuri Segal, and Malik Barkana, and their colleagues at the embassy in Delhi and consulates in Mumbai, Hyderabad, and Mumbai for making this lecture possible and for creating the opportunity for us to host Damon in the exhibition season. Thank you again and have a lovely evening.